Thank you, Chris, very, very much for that uh, very kind introduction uh, and for your friendship and for this incredible event. I don't know how you suddenly rustled up 100 brilliant people in quite short notice, but it's, it's just great to be back in Denver. Great to be back with Chris, one of the truly great entrepreneur innovators uh, of the world today. Uh, and not just that, but a, a thinker and a, and a, uh, a proselytizer on behalf of, of common sense and good ideas. So um, uh, just terrific guy, and it's, I really value my friendship with him. So I've called the talk I'm going to give this morning, A Man-Made Climate, A Man-Made Pandemic, because I'm going around encountering that in the scientific community and the media, there is extreme readiness to accept that not just there's climate change happening and it's man-made, but that every single storm or slightly warm day is caused by people. There's a great exaggeration of the attribution of a single climate events to um, man-made climate change at the moment. And yet this very same scientific establishment is extremely resistant, and the media establishment, to the idea that this pandemic that has turned our lives upside down and killed probably north of 20 million people might have been caused by a mistake in a laboratory. They are highly resistant to that story. I personally think that it's much easier to find good evidence that the pandemic was man-made than that storms were man-made. And I'm going to make that case as well as talk about a couple of other things along the way. So in a sense, I've got two talks. Half of them there's, there's stuff about energy and climate at the start, and then there's stuff about molecular biology in the second half. Sorry about that, but it's going to be a pretty, pretty um, quick switch. Um, but let me start by reminding you that you've only got two and a half months left on planet Earth. <laughs> five years ago, Greta Thunberg, that brilliant climate scientist, uh, said that within five years, all of humanity will be wiped out unless we stop using fossil fuels. Now, last time I checked, the, the plane I flew here on yesterday was using fossil fuels, so we haven't stopped using them. So if she's right, all of humanity is gone in June this year. Great knowing you. Thanks for coming. Uh, enjoy your time in heaven and hell. Um, of course, she's deleted the tweet, but this is a very good example of the sort of ridiculous exaggeration we are now having to put up with on a routine basis not just from people like her, but from mainstream media and other things. It's an uphill struggle trying to keep common sense in this debate. And I think we've been overestimating the harms of increased CO2. And I just want to run through a few um, pieces of evidence suggesting that. And then I'm going to talk about how we've been underestimating the benefits of extra CO2 uh, in the air. Um, John Christie, the great climate modeler uh, who works on satellite work of climate change, says that he went back and looked at 73 climate models going back to 1979, and every single one predicted more warming than happened in the real world. This is the great untold story of the climate change debate. Yes, it's happening. Yes, it's man-made. But it's definitely happening slower than people expected. And here's some data. This is US summer temperatures over 50 years. And all the red bars are what the models predicted would happen, and the blue bar is what actually happened. So every single one over-predicted warming. Here's another example. This is sea surface temperature between 60 degrees north and 60 degrees south um, over about 40 years. And uh, the black line is what's actually happened, and the other lines are all what the models said would happen. Again, you can go through many, many examples of this, Climate change is happening slower than predicted. And as for the effect it's having on human beings, well, we're far less likely to die of climate-related deaths today than at any time uh, in history. Not because climate's safer, not because the weather's less dangerous, but because of better shelter, better transport, better warnings, all that kind of thing. Because we adapt, we work out how to deal with it. Um, and the, uh, the other effects of climate change Again, they're real, but they're not showing anything really dangerous yet. Uh, sea level rising at three to four millimeters a year, that's about one foot per century. So your great-grandchildren are going to have to cope with that much rise in the sea. Um, can we adapt to that? I think we can. 
uh, we adapted to about that much rise in the 20th century. There's no reason we shouldn't be able to adapt to it in the 21st century. Whole countries like the Netherlands and Vietnam are already below sea level and have been for centuries. Uh, now, it could accelerate sea level rise, but it's been predicted to accelerate now for 20, 30 years, and it's not really showing much sign of doing so. The percentage of the world that's in drought is declining, not increasing. You wouldn't believe that if you read much of the media. Um, these are <coughs> moderate, severe, and mild droughts around the world, a so-called Palmer Index of drought. Uh, and they all, however you cook the books, they all show a, um, uh, a declining percentage of the world that's in drought. And that's to be expected. If you warm the oceans a little bit, you get more moisture in the air, you get less, uh, uh, more rainfall. Uh, floods are slightly trickier to measure because some floods are indeed getting worse, but usually for local reasons. You chop down the forests in the Himalayas, lo and behold, you get a bad flood in Pakistan. Um, uh, it's, it's deforestation, it's uh, uh, drainage, it's p uh, paving over river valleys, things like that, that cause most flooding. But as a percentage of GDP, this is US data from Roger Pielke, um, flood is doing less damage every year. Uh, well, not every year, but the, the trend is downwards. The amount of the world that catches fire every year is declining, not increasing. You simply wouldn't believe that if you uh, looked at uh, the media most of the time. Uh, and as for storms, the big one, you know, tropical storms in particular, hurricanes, cyclones, and typhoons, there is no trend upwards. This has been analyzed to death by Roger Pielke at Colorado State University and others. And there is no, uh, there's a lot of variation between years, but there is no increase in either the intensity or the frequency of tropical storms. Um, so if you add all the global and weather climate data disasters together, um, there's no upward trend. So there's nothing happening to attribute to mankind. You know, what, what's, what's the phenomenon that we keep saying is man-made? The warming, yes, but the effect of the warming, there's no data there to say that we need to explain something. And yet, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in its latest report a few weeks ago said this, the evidence of observed changes in extremes such as heat waves, heavy precipitation, droughts, and tropical cyclones, and in particular, their attribution to human influence has strengthened since our last report. Now, heat waves you can see an increase in. Um, heavy precipitation, possibly, I'm not convinced, but droughts and tropical cyclones, no. There is no increase to explain, let alone attribute to human influence. I mean, how can you attribute nothing to human influence? It just doesn't make sense. And yet, as I say, the world <clears throat> is convinced that um, uh, whenever a particular storm happens, it must have been caused by climate change. Meanwhile, I think we're underestimating the benefits of carbon dioxide. That is a really taboo subject. If you want to get yourself drummed out of polite society, talk about, you know, just put up your hand at a dinner party and say, I think carbon dioxide has some benefits, you know. You would be... I mean, end of dinner party, you never get invited back. Um, I made a visit last summer to the uh, farm of a good friend of mine, Sir James Dyson, the great inventor of um, uh, vacuum cleaners and ha hand dryers and things like that. Brilliant guy. And so this is him in his uh, strawberry uh, greenhouse. Huge operation, commercial operation, producing strawberries. Uh, I signed a non-disclosure agreement, so I can't show you the robot that we're looking at, which picks the strawberries. I blacked it out, as you can see. It's a pretty snazzy robot, although it's not yet as quick at people. I probably shouldn't say that, but anyway. Um, uh, but that's not the point. The point I want to make is that there's a sort of flimsy polythene tube above our heads here. That's pumping carbon dioxide into the greenhouse, deliberately. That is true of every commercial greenhouse in the world. They all buy CO2 and put it into the air in order to raise the ambient level in the greenhouse to about 1,000 parts per million, about 0.1%, about two and a half times as high as in the air in this room. It doesn't make it any harder to breathe or anything like that. You know, that is, it's still, you know, 0.1% is not a lot. Um, but it does make the plants grow considerably faster. That's why it's done. And this CO2 fertilization effect has been known for centuries. 
for decades. Um, thousands of experiments have been done in the lab and in the field, so-called free air concentration experiments, where you literally blow CO2 across a field and observe how fast the plants grow. Um, and it's very clear, I won't get into the difference between C3 plants and C4 plants, one type responds faster than another. Most of our crops are C3 plants, so that's good news. Um, but the point is, up to way higher levels of carbon dioxide than we have today, plants respond very well to extra CO2 in the air, and they need less water to do so, so it's particularly effective in dry lands. And around 11 years ago, <clears throat> Professor Jesse Orzabal of uh, Rockefeller University tipped me off to the fact that there was a uh, um, talk online at Boston University by Professor Ranga Mainaini about how they'd repurposed satellites to be able to measure this phenomenon on a global level, to pick up global greening. And he showed this image which shows that most of the world is getting greener every year, not browner. Everything red on that chart is getting less vegetation. Everything green is getting more vegetation. Uh, and he also showed this table, showing that this was happening in every kind of ecosystem, um, and that it r has resulted in a roughly 14% increase in the amount of green vegetation on the planet over 30 years. That seemed to me really quite a significant phenomenon uh, and something worth writing about. So I wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal um, uh, 10 years ago uh, saying that the world is getting greener. This is an interesting discovery, and uh, it might possibly be sort of good news. More food for wildlife, more food for um, crops and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> um, it was not till 2016 that Ranga Mainaini and his colleagues published their work uh, the lead author was Zai Chin Zhu, who'd gone back to Beijing University by then. And he was quoted, he, quote, he wrote in the article, the greening over the past 33 years reported in this study is equivalent to adding a green continent about two times the size of mainland USA. In a third of a century, we've added two continents worth of green vegetation. That seems to me really big news yet you just never read about this. And if it's referred to in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports, <coughs> it's done so very, very briefly and in a dismissive tone, saying it may not last or something like that. And by the way, they were able to tease out how much of this greening is down to fertilizers or pesticides or um, extra rainfall or more irrigation or something, and they reckon 70% of that greening came from extra CO2 in the atmosphere. That's a big benefit that we've had out of raising the CO2 level from 280 to 410 parts per million, roughly speaking. Anyway, their paper was accompanied by a press release from Boston University, and I was mentioned in the press release because they wanted to make sure that nobody took from people like me the unfashionable message that this might be good news. We're not supposed to look on the bright side here at all. For some reason, I was, um, me and Rupert Murdoch were in the frame for this. I um, don't know why. It's a sort of odd way of going about science, but there we are. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, you can look up the data yourselves. This is from NASA's website. Uh, this is slightly updated to 2015. Um, the world is still getting greener, particularly the dry areas, particularly the far north. Um, you know, the Sahel region of Africa, where an awful lot of people live and where agriculture is often very marginal, significant improvements in the amount of green vegetation on the planet. That's quite a big benefit that we're getting from all the CO2 in the atmosphere. So if, if we take the fact that we've been overestimating the harm and underestimating the benefits of CO2, oh, and by the way, there are lots of other benefits. You know, warming means fewer people die because most people die in cold seasons in pretty well every country in the world. Um, it means that most of the warming is in the Arctic and very little of it is in the tropics in daytime or in the, uh, warm seasons. It's mostly in cold seasons at cold times of day and in cold places. Um, if you take all these other benefits into account, there's, there's a significant chunk on the ledger side of benefits of climate change. So calculating the net effect of CO2, um, the, the 
the phrase for this is the social cost of carbon, and uh, the US government currently reckons it's $51 a tonne. It's used that number for about 10 years. Um, it's a strangely precise number. I don't know quite how they reach it. Um, it's, measure, it's defined as the cost of damage, not the net cost, the cost of damage. They don't even assume there are benefits. They just assume there aren't any and count every possible damage that might happen. Uh, so every ton of CO2 that goes into the atmosphere uh, costs $51 in terms of damage. Um, now, the UK government is... Uh, the US government doesn't mention this number much anymore, and nor does the UK government. And I got my good friend John Constable, the brilliant um, energy analyst uh, friend of mine who I think has been here, and certainly, Chris, you know him, um, to, uh, I asked him about this. Why aren't we hearing about the social cost of carbon these days? And he said that he asked the head of energy in the UK government, why did you abandon the social cost of carbon? And he said, oh, it was embarrassing. You see, we couldn't find a mitigation policy with an abatement cost even close to the social cost, let alone below it. So in other words, cutting emissions is costing us more than their estimate of the damage that carbon dioxide is actually doing. But is that estimate even realistic, $50 a tonne? Well, there's a brilliant new paper by Kevin Dyeratner, Ross McKittrick, and Patrick Michaels uh, in which they estimate what the social cost of carbon actually is using better assumptions than the current models have done. In particular, they say that the current models have vastly underestimated the carbon dioxide fertilization effect. They don't take into account the results of um, uh, Rangamineni and Zhu and people like that. Um, they understate our ability to adapt. They just ignore the fact that we actually, you know, we change which crops we grow if it warms up or if it dries out or something like that. Um, they overstate the sensitivity of the atmosphere to climate. We can now see, and that's why the models have always overestimated warming, is because they have a, a huge assumption about positive feedbacks from clouds and water vapor, which is turning out to be wrong. Uh, and they use l low to zero discount rates. Another way of putting that is that they want today's poor people to pay for the problems that affect tomorrow's rich people, whereas I don't think that's really fair on today's poor people. So if you run some more realistic assumptions through um, their models of the co social cost of carbon, you find that the number, the social cost of carbon, is actually negative. That is to say, it's a net benefit. And it's a net benefit out to 2050. So for the next 27 years, Every bit of CO2 going into the atmosphere is doing a, a net benefit to the world. That's a pretty striking result. And yet, as I say, if I were to ring up the BBC and say, would you let me um, make this point in an interview, they would, they would literally say, no, people with views like that are not allowed on our network. <laughs> so I want to switch directions at this point. I don't think every storm and flood is man-made at the moment. I think attributing them to it is, uh, 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 is, is, is over-certain. But I think the possibility that the pandemic we've just been through is man-made is definitely possible. Uh, as Chris said, I teamed up with a brilliant young molecular biologist at Harvard and MIT called Alina Chan to write a book about this because I began to get suspicious in the spring of 2020 that we weren't hearing both sides of this story uh, and that there were strange anomalies that needed explaining in what we were hearing. And we went down a very deep rabbit hole on this, um, and I'm not sure I've quite emerged yet. Um, and uh, we found some extraordinary resources, some, some, some wonderful people who are digging up interesting stuff. We don't yet know the answer, and in our book, we don't pretend to. We show, not tell. We show you all the evidence and say, you make up your mind what the story is. But we both think it's now quite likely that it came out of a laboratory. Let me just remind you what we're dealing with. Uh, there are four kinds of coronavirus, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Um, four viruses, two betas and two alphas, have been infecting human beings for centuries. 
They cause a version of the common cold. They cause about a fifth of common colds. Um, and two other ones erupted into the human species in 2002, three SARS, and in 2012, MERS in Saudi Arabia, both with very high fatality rates, really scary, but both relatively brief outbreaks because they weren't particularly infectious. And then in 2019, a very close cousin of SARS appeared in Wuhan with a very high infectivity but a relatively low mortality. Uh, and that's what we have to explain. Now, this group of viruses that it's in are the SARS-like beta coronaviruses or Sabika viruses is the group we have to consider. And they are found, their natural habitat is the intestine of one genus of old world bat, the horseshoe bat. There are about 100 species of horseshoe bats in Asia and Africa and Europe. Um, and uh, if you want to find Sabico viruses, you have to go and look in their guts. That's the place they were found. And we know that thanks to the work of a scientist called Xi Zheng Li, who in the wake of the SARS epidemic, um, set out to track down where these viruses were found naturally and eventually concluded rather brilliantly um, that uh, they were concentrated in bat caves, bat colonies, in um, uh, limestone caves in uh, southern Yunnan mainly. That's certainly where SARS probably came from. So they're very interested in that part of southwest China. Um, and so the question is, how does a virus get from the inside of a bat in a distant cave to a city a long way away? Because they did not find these viruses near Wuhan. Uh, and there are four ways it could happen. It could have been an intermediate animal, like happened in the case of SARS, that, a civ that, that palm civets got infected. These were sold in markets. The people who sold them and the people who butchered them were the first to get infected with the virus. There was a very clear pattern of animal to human transmission, and the first people to, connect, to get the virus were, were animals. Or it could have been that it was a human being who picked up the virus in a bat cave and brought it to the city. Somebody who was mining bat guano, a villager who went into the, vi the, the bat cave for shelter, or a tourist, or something like that. Or that human being could have been a scientist deliberately going into the bat caves looking for bats and sampling them, and there was a lot of that going on in the wake of SARS. And it could have been that those samples brought back to the lab caused an accident. So those seem to us to be four equally possible op, 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 uh, opportunities for the virus to get to Wuhan. Um, and in the beginning, the authorities assured us it definitely came through the market, through animal transmission like SARS did. Uh, and they said uh, that they were closing the market and they'd found a concentration of cases around the market. We later found that that wasn't very helpful because for the first three weeks of January, if you went to the doctor with pneumonia, you were only sent for testing for the new virus if you also said you'd been to the market. So it's a completely circular argument to say that the first cases were near the market. Um, uh, and by the way, in saying you could only catch it from a human being, which they said up until the 18th of January, they missed a really good chance to stop this at the beginning because doctors and nurses were getting infected like crazy in hospitals in those three weeks when the Chinese authorities were saying, no, no, you can only get it from an animal. You can't get it from a person. Um, so there we are. Anyway, we've gradually found out more about what was going on in that market. There's a huge effort by a number of Western scientists to say, to still say it definitely came out of the market. There's been another push last week to, to, to claim that. The Chinese don't say that anymore. George Gao, the head of the Centers for Disease Control in Beijing, says it didn't come out of the market. The market was a super spreader event that amplified the early pandemic, but that wasn't where it started. And the evidence that he brings forward is pretty convincing. Yes, they found the virus in the market. It was in the sewage and on surfaces, doorknobs, countertops, and so on. Um, it was the human version of the virus. They never found a, a, a different, you know, a 98, 99% version of the virus. They found 99.99% versions. Um, uh, it, they only found the B strain, which is a, not the ancestral strain. The oldest strain, the ancestral strain in human beings is called the A strain. They found one sample of that on a glove, 
and, and they found that in January. Well, by then it was everywhere, so that doesn't really tell us anything. Um, they found no infected animals. In the case of SARS, they very quickly found palm civets with the virus, with a different, slightly different virus. Um, they tested about 500 animals from 18 species. They definitely missed some. They missed the raccoon dogs we now know. So it's possible that there was an infected uh, other animal, but uh, it's pretty surprising that they didn't find any infected animals, and they didn't find, find any infected animal vendors. You know, they tested the people who sold live animals in that market. None of them were infected. One shrimp seller was infected, but nobody thinks it came in on shrimps. Um, and there were no infected food handlers. Again, in the case of SARS, there were chefs and people like that who were picking it up early on. And there were, by the way, no bats and no pangolins on sale. Pangolins are a red herring. I won't get into them. But for a while, they were uh, flavor of the month. So the evidence that this thing started in a market is not very strong at the moment. Can't rule it out yet, but it's not very strong. So what might have happened? Well, the first publication about the genome of this virus came from Shi Zheng Li's group at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And she described the genome of this virus. And she also said that they'd found a close relative in bats called RATG13, a 96.2% similar um, virus in a bat. So where had they found it? In their own freezer, right? Inside the Wuhan Institute of Virology. We later found out that they had eight other very closely related bat viruses in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which they didn't tell us. We, we basically found that out, and they then admitted to it. And they, the remarks she made about it were all a bit odd, that she implied that they'd only just noticed this, diff this similarity and that they'd now sequenced it in order to see how similar it was. Actually, they'd sequenced it in 2018, meaning they'd been working on this bat virus in the lab the year before the pandemic. Oh, and by the way, they'd changed the name. It was called something else up until 2019. This name, RATG13, was a brand new name. There's no reference, no link, so it took me nearly two months to work out the story of where they'd found it and how they'd found it. That's pretty non-transparent when we're dealing with a global pandemic. Where had they found it? Well, they'd found it in a copper mine, a mine shaft in southern Yunnan, uh, about 21 hours' drive from Wuhan, so not nearby, right? Um, about as far as um, Orlando to New York. And uh, what had happened in that copper mine was that in 2012, six people shoveling back guano had got very sick. The copper price went up that year. Somebody said, let's reopen the copper mine. They sent in some guys to shovel out the back guano and sell it and, uh, for fertilizer. And these guys got really sick. Um, and three of them died. Three of them eventually recovered. And it looked like SARS. So all hell broke loose in Chinese virology. Every expert from all over the country was called in to try and help track down what was happening. Um, huge precautions were taken. It was a big deal at the time. It got very little publicity. A little bit got into the Western press. Um, and the Wuhan Institute of Virology was called in. Samples from the men's lungs were sent to Wuhan, nowhere else. And the Wuhan Institute of Virology, Xi Zheng Li's lab, went to the mine shaft, sampled the bats, and went back six more times. They, they made seven expeditions to this mine shaft to collect bats, bring back live bats, bring back bat samples, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, here they are on one of their visits uh, to that mine shaft. This is the only photograph we have, taking extreme precautions, as you can tell. Um, if we lighten the picture, you can see in the background the barred entrance to the mine shaft. Um, several reporters have tried to get to this site since. Uh, it's impossible. You are um, basically uh, met with extreme hostility, as John Sudworth of the BBC put it, um, state security, plainclothes police, uniform police, and local residents were all um, uh, telling him to go away. Um, uh, and by the way, Google has now blurred the area on its maps, which is quite interesting. It, it used to be possible to look into the forest in some detail, but can't be now. Um, so it's possible that in one of those expeditions, they brought back the immediate precursor or a very similar virus to the one that's caused the pandemic, um, and that it leaked from their laboratory. Um, 
And it's not implausible that that would happen. We've had lots of leaks over the years from laboratory accidents, um, far too many to count, but the serious ones are quite interesting. I won't go through them all, but uh, here are some of the ones, the cases where people got infected because of mistakes made in labs. And just to single out one, the 2003-04 SARS leaks. This was after the SARS epidemic was over. There was no SARS in the human population, but it was still being studied in labs. And in Singapore, Taiwan, and four times in Beijing, in, researchers got infected. And in five of those six occasions, they didn't know how they did it. They didn't drop a flask or puncture a glove, but they were working on SARS and they picked it up. And in one of the Beijing cases, the woman then traveled a thousand miles coughing and gave it to several other people, including her mother who died. It was very nearly another pandemic. So this thing can happen. And in 2007 in England, an animal disease called foot and mouth virus broke out 13 miles on a farm, 13 miles from the world's reference laboratory for foot and mouth viruses. And we didn't say, <laughs> just a coincidence, we know, nothing to worry about. Uh, I mean, you know, these things happen. Um, we said, hang on a minute, this doesn't sound right. And the, within a week, it had, it had been found out that a contractor had broken, had been mending a broken pipe at the lab and had gone straight to the farm, and that's how the infection had started. So when a bat SARS like coronavirus outbreak happens eight miles from the world's leading laboratory for studying bat-like SARS, bat SARS like bat coronaviruses. It's quite a coincidence. Um, and the US Embassy had visited that lab in 2018 um, because they were, the US labs, particularly at Galveston in Texas, had been involved in helping them set up their new high security lab and uh, they came back and said their security procedures are not very good. Their biosafety levels are worrying. And they said the lab's work on bat coronaviruses and their potential human transmission represents a risk of a new SARS-like pandemic. They said that the year before the pandemic. Um, stop me if I'm boring you here, but I'm interested in this stuff. Um, uh, so we found a number of close relatives of the virus causing the pandemic now. The most closely related ones, the reddest ones on this map, are located in Yunnan in southwest China. But in 2021, some French scientists said, ah, oh, we found one in Laos. And it's even more closely related than that RATG13 from the mineshaft. It's 96.8% the same, not 96.2% the same. Now, the reason it's more closely related is because it's got a more similar spike gene. All the other genes are slightly less closely related, so we don't quite know what to make of that. But still, that's an interesting challenge. And at the time, this was said, right, so it can't be anything to do with our expeditions from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Can it? So I said, well, yes, it can, because you, the EcoHealth Alliance in America, which is the Wuhan Institute of Virology's US partner that funnels US taxpayers' money to the work at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, has been collecting viruses in Laos from bats. And where's it been sending them? To the Wuhan Institute of Virology in China. And they replied in a tweet, that's not the case. So I said, well, here's an entry in a genomic database with a, um, uh, a, do I have a pointer here, I don't, yes, with a, um, uh, Peter Dazak of the Wuhan Institute of Virology, uh, of the EcoHealth Alliance, has um, uh, deposited a virus at the Wuhan Institute of Virology that comes from Laos. What am I missing here? And they won't reply to my tweet. I've asked them about eight more times, and I've had no answer. So here is Peter Dazak, the head of the Wuhan Institute of, uh, sorry, of the EcoHealth Alliance, and the guy who has had about $100 million over um, uh, 10 years to work on um, emerging threats of viruses and, and has funneled a lot of that money to partner organizations, including the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And here he is speaking in December 2019, the very month that SARS was breaking out in Wuhan, although he didn't know that at the time, describing what they did in the lab. 
coronavirus is pretty good. You can manipulate them easily. The spike protein drives a lot of what happens. You can get the sequences, build the protein, insert the backbone of another virus, and do some work in a lab. Now, what he's saying here is that when you sample bats in the wild, you find traces of viruses, but they're not very easy to grow in the lab. So what you do is you read their sequence, synthesize their spike protein, stick it in place of the existing spike protein, one of the viruses you can grow, making a so-called chimera virus, and then try it out on human cells and humanized mice, mice with humanized genes, and see whether it is, can infect them. And in some of those experiments, they found that the virus, when the new spike was put into it, was 10,000 times more infectious than before. These are gain-of-function experiments with knobs on. Um, and so um, what do we know about the experiments they were doing up until then? Well, we do know the viruses they were using for these experiments up to 2015, but we don't know them after that. They've published none of the names of the viruses they were working on after 2016. So that's what we'd really like to know. Which viruses did you do these experiments on in the period 2016 to 19, right? And they have that data because they have a database with all the viruses they've ever worked on in it and everything they know about them. So it'd be nice to look at that database. It's called the Bat and Rodent Born Viral Pathogen Database, although its name changed on the um, 30th of December, the day the pandemic was declared, interestingly. Um, and it went offline at two in the morning on the 12th of September, 2019, three months before the pandemic. Um, and when we say, as we ask again and again and again, please share what's in that database, because if it doesn't have a SARS-2-like virus in it, it exonerates you. So you ought to be keen to share it. They say, no, we can't share it with you because you might hack it. What does that mean? I mean, if you shared it with us, you don't mind it being hacked. There's no such thing as hacking when it's shared. Anyway, it, that's where we're at. So it's very odd that they won't share that information. And the scene shifts back to February 2020 and what's happening in the US and the UK now. Because Jeremy Farrow, the head of the Wellcome Institute, the Wellcome Foundation, the, the biggest, um, Wellcome Trust actually, the biggest medical, biomedical charity in the world, um, got in touch with Anthony Fauci and Francis Collins in the US and said, we need to have a serious conversation because something strange is going on. Uh, we've basically taken a look at this virus and it looks like it's got a feature in it that looks man-made. We need to worry about that. And this is Fauci's response. For months, it was redacted in the Freedom of Information stuff, which wasn't very helpful. We eventually found out what this email said. And it said, I just got off the phone with Christian Anderson, one of these virologists, and he related me his concern about the furine site mutation in the spike protein. And we've got to get together and talk about this, and because you know, if it's come as out of, a, if it's man-made, that's pretty worrying. Um, and we need to tell the FBI and MI5, and you know, this is quite exciting stuff. Fauci never breathed a word of this. He, within days, he was going in press conferences saying it cannot possibly have been man-made. He thought something completely different in private. Highest-paid U.S. civil, U.S. government employee, by the way, um, bar none. Um, What's a furin cleavage site and why does it matter? Sorry, we're near, near the end, don't worry, but I'm sorry about this. Um, um, as you can tell, I'm quite excited about all this. Um, a furin cleavage site is, a fee is the reason we're having a pandemic. If this virus didn't have a furin cleavage site in it, we would be, it wouldn't be nearly as infectious and we wouldn't have a problem controlling it. And it's a bunch of arginines in the same part of the spike virus. If you get three out of four um, residues in this part of the protein being arginine, that for which the abbreviation is R, um, then furin comes along and clips the virus at this point, the, the, the spike at this point, and that opens it up like a flower and makes it way more infectious. Um, scientists have known this for a very long time. Some some coronaviruses have furin cleavage sites, some don't. Um, some other viruses have furin cleavage sites. Um, 
they've been putting furin cleavage sites into viruses to see what effect it has, it's usually in a safe way, i.e. they're using a, an inactivated virus, but sometimes in live viruses, for about 10 years now. There have been at least 12 such experiments done, mostly in the US, but two or three in China, and at least two in Wuhan. And one of them by, by Xi Zheng Li and her group. They used a MERS-like coronavirus. They created a furin cleavage site in it. It doesn't have one. MERS has one, but this virus doesn't. They created it. They tested it to see what effect it has. So it's quite a common experiment to put a furin cleavage site into a novel virus. And, uh, but, you know, maybe this is natural. Maybe all viruses have this. So let's look at the close relatives of SARS-CoV-2 and see whether it's got it. Nope. It's completely lacking the arginine concentration in this area because the only reason that furin cleavage site is there is because 12 overlapping base pairs have been added to the genome of the virus. You can't get 12 by a mutation. That's an insertion. That's pretty difficult to explain naturally, um, in one go at least. So, you know, superficially, um, Fauci was right to be worried. This does look man-made, given what we know about what they were capable of doing, uh, what they had done in the past with others, and, and what, what you could do. But were they actually doing it? Well, they had a plan to. Um, we now know, thanks to Peter Daszak not telling us, that he put in an application to DARPA at the Pentagon for $14 million in 2018 to work with the, the Wuhan Institute of Virology on a number of new experiments on SARS-like bat-borne coronaviruses. And one of those experiments was to be the insertion of a furin cleavage site. I mean, here he is saying that they want to find three to five new bat viruses a year and test them in human airway epithelial cultures. That's human cells taken from the lung. Um, here he is saying that they want to look for furin cleavage sites in them. And here he is saying where we don't find one, we'll introduce one. Human-specific cleavage sites and then evaluate their growth potential. In other words, infect them into viral cells from monkeys and human airway epithelial cell cultures. So if that's not a recipe for creating SARS-CoV-2, then I don't know what is. Thank you very much. <laughs>